And now I'm going to continue with the next part of the questions. So handling problems of people, because uh, in a church there are very often problems of people. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's uh, people who uh, cause problems in the church, who argue with other people, who, uh, who don't have good relationship with people and yell at people or chase up the women or, uh, um, or uh, do uh, things to the, do negative things to the leaders. Um, so there are different things that people could do. And these are destructive to the church. And sometimes even the leaders could have problems because they are too controlling and control the people and cause problems. So we should all uh, be aware of any kinds of problem within the church and help keep the church to be holy and loving and in unity. And how, now the question here, first question is how important is forgiveness? God is a forgiving God. That is why we can have relationship with Him. He wants everyone in the kingdom of God to be forgiving other people. Because everyone has some kind of problem. So everyone has need of forgiveness. If there is no forgiveness, that means there will be a relational problem and uh, people cannot uh, uh, live with each other, cannot face each other. And unforgiveness will also break up a church and uh, and it will you know cause the church to split in the two or different problems and also unforgiveness will also cause uh, unforgiveness from God the Father because the Father uh, Jesus said that you know if you don't forgive your neighbor's sins then your father in heaven also will not forgive you so it's very super important that we must forgive even when people have committed something wrong and they haven't repented we still forgive them we still forgive them not because they are good and perfect it's because they you know uh, it's the commandment of God that we forgive all people okay second Timothy 2 14 not to strive about words to no profits to the ruin of the hearers what will arguments produce how to avoid arguments so this passage says that not to strive about words to no profits so when we strive about words that means argue about unimportant things uh, now sometimes people say we are arguing about teachings now even when we have difference in teachings when it's not the most essential, the most essential teaching would be about salvation and the good works of salvation uh, and about the authority of the Bible. Now, even when people disagree on things, uh, that is not essential. For instance, uh, different churches have different teachings that are different. We don't want to argue about those. We can tell people about what we believe. We can discuss with them. but. If they disagree, disagree, we just let go. We just uh, leave it to God. God will judge and uh, we'll just do our best to understand the Bible, to, um, to that we follow the Bible, that we, all the teachings come from the Bible. And then we don't want to argue about uh, words. Now, other than teachings, uh, there are other things that people argue about. For instance, someone says something and then other people argue about it. It doesn't do any good. So it's argument doesn't do any good. We want to uh, discuss and if someone can insists that he believes this way, we just um, let him do that. <clears throat> and we want to... Uh, To keep the unity of the Christians. We want to keep the unity of the church. Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Now how to avoid arguments? The way to avoid is to um, discuss and lead the person 
uh, to try to find the truth and uh, and not to fight about words and 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 sometimes we have to let go if someone doesn't accept certain things even when someone doesn't want to accept the basic truth we explain to them and they don't accept it we just let go uh, we just pray that we have another chance to try to bring the person to believe in the basic truth and arguments will produce uh, breaking of a church and also breaking of relationship if we still have a good relationship we can still try to change the person uh, with time but if we break the relationship then there is no chance to change the person's uh, basic beliefs Matthew 18 verses 15 to 17 handle problems of people face to face and one to one then handle with one or two then handle with the whole church what could happen if people don't follow this? How is this helpful to handle problems of people? So if people don't follow this, what happens is like if someone knows, A knows that B has some problem and then A talks to another person about it and this could start a series of gossip and it will, it will cause a lot of problems. Uh, because then B will say that we we'll accuse A of gossiping and it would muddle up the problem the problem was originally that B has done something wrong now B accuses A of gossiping so we don't want to gossip we want to face a person face to face but many people I, I, I come across they told me about some problem of some other person I'm the pastor they can tell me and I advise them can you talk with the person to try to resolve the problem and um, very often they say no I cannot I cannot face the person he will not accept now it's true that it's very hard but if he cannot tell the other person then he has to keep his mouth shut then he won't tell anyone about it so either tell the person or not tell anyone so don't gossip but many people cannot tell the person but they keep gossiping and this will cause problem um, and it will help resolve the problem when we face a person face to face but when we face a person we must handle it gently and not to insist our way but to guide the person and to discuss and uh, sometimes if it we cannot resolve it then we have to find one or two persons to 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 be witness to uh, lead the discussion and to uh, resolve the problem okay, and then handling problems of people the steps are first discern what the issues are so this is how to handle problem of people first discern what the issues are by asking questions and listening now because sometimes we say a and b have some problem and then we have our own uh, conception of what really happened but it might not be true so we have to ask A and ask B together what really happened they might tell a different story and then we try to find out what really happened and we ask them what exactly did they say what did the other person say to find out what exactly happened because sometimes people quote another person's words and they quote inaccurately so we need to listen and ask questions Two, listen and respond to the feelings and needs sometimes people have problem because of feelings they feel hurts they feel unhappy they feel despised by the other person so instead of handling the issue they originally talk about if they feel despised we want to handle that we want to resolve the problem of being despised we want to help them to be able to accept each other and love each other and and face the problem in love instead of uh, despising the person so we need to listen to the feelings and their needs and then invite them to analyze and explore how to resolve by asking questions so we ask them so do you want to resolve this problem uh, you know as brothers and sisters we always want to resolve problems we never want to leave the problems as they are we never want to leave the problems as they are we must 
and uh, we must try to resolve the problems. So we invite, invite them to analyze and explore how to resolve the problem uh, by asking questions. We, our goal is always to resolve the problem and never to leave the problem as they are. And four, never accuse. Don't ac accuse them. Please explain these steps, I, which I just did. So um, discern the issues by asking questions and listening, listening to them, and then listen to the feelings and needs and respond to them and guide them to respond to each other, invite them to analyze the problem and find, try to find a way to resolve the problem and not to accuse. Do you think they're workable? Now, if both persons are willing to forgive and love each other and arrive at a solution, then it's workable. But if one person refuses to resolve the problem, or one person refuses to forgive, then the problem is not solvable. But if one person, say B, doesn't want to forgive A, then A can forgive B and then put down the problem and not to, to be bothered by the problem. So it's very important that he's not bothered by the problem, but he will continue to forgive B continue to be kind to be and uh, not to break the relationship. So it's workable even when person, one person doesn't forgive and doesn't uh, work, uh, cooperate. If the other person try his best, do his best, does his best, then it's still workable to a certain extent except that B will not forgive and then that is his problem. But A is willing to forgive. So what are things that we have to pay attention to? We have to pay attention to the feelings of people. We have to pay attention to build, uh, keeping the unity of the whole group. We want to pay attention to uh, the, uh, the needs of each person and uh, how to forgive, how to bring forgiveness, how to uh, care about, about each other and how it would affect the church. Now sometimes when two persons, two influential persons, they dislike each other, they have a problem. It can affect the whole church to split. So we want to pay attention that this problem will not cause more problem in the church. We have to pay attention to that and uh, be aware. Uh, to, we want to find out what goes on and then to stop the problems getting worse and worse. How imp Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, and then ministers, marriage, and family. Ephesians 5.21 Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. So does the Bible teach, teach, does the Bible teach an absolute submission of the wives? Or does it talk about a mutual submission? The Bible does talk about submitting to one another. In, verse, in Ephesians 5.21 and then 5.22 talks about the wife submitting to your husband. So the Bible does talk about submitting to one another. So both the husband and the wife should submit to each other. That means they will listen to each other and respond to their needs instead of just insisting on the other person to submit to them. Um, so so the, the, the Bible does talk about the wives would pay attention to submission and the husband will pay attention to loving the wife. But still, it doesn't mean that the husband will dominate and control the wife, that he should listen to the wife and respond to her needs and submit to her needs. Okay, Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Why is it hard for most husbands to love their wives? How could, can we uh, develop this love? Um, so it's important to love your, the wives as Christ has loved the church. Why is it hard for most people, husbands to love their wives? Because uh, generally males have a problem of loving. Males need to learn to love. Males pay more attention to work and doing things, uh, achieving things, B 
being better than other people instead of paying attention to love and relationship and listening to the wife. So that's why uh, Paul reminded husbands to love their wives. And um, it's hard because husbands want to be, sometimes they want to be the Lord of the family and it's hard to, for them to love. And uh, it's something we need to learn. And how can we develop this love? We can develop this love by... Okay, um, how can we develop this love? Husbands should learn, you know, that pastors should teach the people in the church how to love, how to listen to the wife, be caring to the wife, care about her feelings. And instead of saying she talks too much, the husband should learn to understand why the wife is unhappy, why the wife has certain things to say, why the wife is emotional, there are reasons. Sometimes the husband insists on his way and doesn't care about her feeling because males generally can put down their feelings easily. Now it's not necessarily a good thing because they would just uh, suppress the feelings. So they say if you're unhappy just suppress it, don't think about it, just do something else. So they have this way and then they want the wife not to talk about their feelings so they don't listen. And generally women are more sensitive to feelings. They're more sensitive to, to loving and being loved. When she feels not being loved, when she feels that, when she observes that the husband talks to other women more and pay attention to other women more than to the wife, then the wife will become unhappy and the husband is unhappy to hear that. He doesn't want to hear that because he, he, he feels happy with other women. But this makes the wife jealous. This makes the wife lose her security, her sense of security. So the husband should listen to the wife and pay more attention to her, be kind to her, be loving to her. Now the husband might say, well, the other women are more lovely. They, they, they would tease with me, they will, you know, they, uh, we can enjoy each other, but my wife is always serious and unhappy. Now, because generally women pay more attention to the whole family. She's, she has a strong sense of responsibility. So in the family, when she sees that things are not do, uh, going well, then she is unhappy and she will talk about it. And, but other women, they don't have to face the problem of this family. So they, don't, they won't get so unhappy, but the wife will get unhappy. So the husband needs to listen to the wife and try to resolve the problem. And then give and love the wife to bring more joy to her so that she feels happy with the husband. And then she won't be emotional. Uh, that her, she will be more peaceful. So he need to learn to listen to the wife and understand her feelings and care about her and love her. And that way, that is glorifying God. And that is not giving the devil a foothold to attack the family. Okay, is it important to give time to the spouse and children? Is it a waste of time? Now many people think that it's a waste of time to give time to the wife. It's, it's uh, using too much time. But uh, this is important time. We should put the priority first is God. And then next is family. Next is church and ministry. So it's not putting ministry first, but putting God first and then the family that we want to build a family that the family has love so it's important to give time to the spouse and giving time to the spouse and listening to her will help the pastor to understand human feelings more because women understand feelings more and then he can learn to understand feelings and then he can grow in his life and his in his ministry so it's important to give time to the spouse and the children now I observe that in many African countries, they often have the men eat together and then the, the wife and the children eat in the kitchen. That is not the best way because what happens is then it doesn't build up the f family. 
then the one, man just talk with his friends. Uh, and men like to, you know, men generally like to talk and uh, with outsiders of the family, outsiders of the family. And this way, it doesn't build up the relationship with the wife and with the children. He should put the wife and the children above the friends. So if the friends come, they'll eat together. The whole family eat together and relate to the friend. That is the healthy way. Okay, so that way it will uh, build up the relationship. And then, female treasure relationship more than male. When a husband loves his wife, she will be more peaceful and supportive of the husband. If not, she will be more emotional. How should we apply this to our marriage? That we realize that uh, it's uh, because female treasure relationship more than male. So when the husband loves the the wife, she will be more peaceful and supportive of the husband. Then she will be she will be uh, enjoying the family. If not, she will be more emotional. Then she will be uh, she when she feels not loved by the by the husband. Then she will feel frustrated and angry and then uh, it would cause problem to our marriage. So the husband should listen to the wife and love her and so that she will enjoy, both person will enjoy the marriage and both person will be supportive of the other person. Are you willing to love your spouse to give time to her and listen to and respond and say sorry and treasure and resolve problems? So this is very important. It's a matter of willingness. Are we willing to, to love your spouse and give time to the spouse and listen and respond and listen and then respond. Now some people listen and they don't respond. They, don't, they say, I don't know how to respond. Then they can say, oh, I heard that you say that you're unhappy. You're unhappy about this. Can you tell me more about it? Uh, you're unhappy that I talk with this lady more. Tell me more about it. And so res uh, respond. And then both persons should not accuse. The wife should not say, you're loving that woman more than me. No, no, she doesn't know that yet. So she has to find out, is that true? And the husband needs to examine himself. Does he like to be the other woman? to be with the other woman more than with his wife. That's, he finds that because the other woman doesn't have to be involved in his family, so the other woman will not nag, will not complain. But the wife, because she has to face all the problems in the family, so she will nag and complain. So he will listen to the wife and, and find ways how to resolve the problem and say sorry for what he has done wrong and treasure the relationship and resolve the problems. Okay, so um, most is very important that we are willing to do that. So, what do you think of the custom of men eating together, women and children eating separately? I think this is not good. So, I hope you will change that. Even when there are visitors, then eat together with the women, with the wives and the children, that they can relate, and then this will train the children to be able to talk with adults. If not, the children don't know how to relate to adults. They don't know, you know, they just know how to relate to children. They don't know how to relate to adults. And it will help the children to grow up. It's very important. Our first responsibility is to uh, bless our, <coughs> our wife and our children. Then our children will grow up well. So I think that we should change this custom. There are customs in different places. For, uh, that are not biblical. For instance, I heard that in some places that when a wife becomes a widow, when the husband dies, some cultures don't allow the woman to marry again. Now Paul said that when the husband dies, the woman can marry again. But some places, they don't allow the woman to remarry. So this is wrong biblically. So we want to follow the Bible, not the custom of the land. Okay, minister's attitude toward the ministry. Uh, we just talked about that earlier today. So all the days ordained for me were written in your book. Uh, so all the days of our life. And if 
each person's life is written in God's book, then the collective uh, thing about the, all the people of the church will also be written. So then God also has a plan in the church. God has a plan in individuals. It's all written in God's book. And then it's also uh, the church, the collective. Uh, the church is the gathering of the Christians. So all the Christians' life would be written in God's book. And then, so that means the church is written in God's book. That means God has a plan in the church as well as in individuals. He wants to bless the churches, except that when people don't follow God, when people don't have a close relationship with God, when people have sins, when people don't love God, then they, uh, then God's presence is very weak in that church. And then the church will have different problems. So it's very important that for us to realize that God is responsible for the church. When we love Him and obey Him and serve Him and glorify God, then the church will be blessed and the people will be changed and the people will grow and then uh, the church will grow. How does God's presence help our ministry? Uh, it's a very important concept. That um, It's very important that God's presence, when people love God, worship God together, then God's presence will be strong in the church. When God's presence is strong in the church, then people coming to the church will experience more peace. For instance, when people worship together and praise God together, God's presence will be stronger. It's like in the early church, when the church worship and pray together, then the whole place shake and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So God's presence will increase when people love God more and obey God more and serve God more. And God's presence will bring more peace and joy and love and unity. And then the people will grow together and the church will grow together. So it's very important for the pastor and the people to spend more time with God and love God. And all day long we worship God and thank God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord and obey God and be kind to people and to be nice to people. Then the church will grow. And then some churches have a tendency of becoming just um, teaching knowledge. Sometimes for some people, the church could become just teaching knowledge. Now the church is not just teaching knowledge. The church is a place that we relate to God. That we, it's not just teaching biblical knowledge, but also helping people to relate to God and helping people to pray to God, to love God, to build up the relationship with God. 1 Corinthians 4 2, moreover, is required in stewards that one is uh, be found faithful when we are working hard and are faithful, do we have to, be, to feel guilty if our ministry does not grow big? So when we are faithful, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. So when, when we are faithful, we don't have to accuse ourselves. We don't have to feel guilty when the church does not grow enough. Now we can find ways how to help the church grow. But we don't have to feel guilty. We can say, Lord, uh, I try my best to trust in you and have a good relationship with you and obey you. Please guide me how to help the church to grow. And then we, if we do everything we know how to do it, then already God is happy with us. So I hope that we don't feel guilty about the church not growing. We just do our best and trust in God and relax. When we relax and we are more joyful, it will cause the church to grow more. Then when we have pressure, you know, some ministers serve under pressure. They say, I have to help the church grow. The church is not growing. I have to find ways. Uh, and they're under pressure. Then people can see that the pastor is under pressure. It's better that the pastor can enjoy God and to be joyful with God. And then he has strength. He has strength to, uh, to serve God. And, uh, and the church will grow more. Okay, and then... Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke 10, 19. How can Satan attack us? Do we have to fear Satan? Satan attacks Christians or the church when the church or Christians have sins. 
when we live in sin and don't have a close relationship with God and then Satan can attack us. But if we love God and obey God and have a close relationship with God, have a strong presence of God and forsake all the sins and put down and take care of the negative emotions and thinking and uh, anything negative we take care of and we uh, forgive each other, we obey God and love God and love people, then we don't have to fear the devil. The devil has no power over us when we trust God. So we, so as Christians and, and as church and also the pastors should lead the whole church to love God and believe that we have victory over Satan. I've met many Christians who are always afraid of attack from Satan. They, when they get a fever, they say, Satan has attacked me. When they have a fight, they say that Satan attacked them. Now, it's sickness doesn't necessarily mean the attack from Satan. And also fight with people, yelling with, at people, actually it comes from sin of people. Some people say, Satan causes me to be angry. Well, then we have a close relationship with God and we handle our emotions and handle the emotions of the other person, then we don't have to be angry. So it's something we can handle with the help of God. But some people blame it on Satan. Satan causes me to be angry, so I got angry. It's Satan's attack. So they blame Satan for what they do. That instead we should repent of what we've done wrong and ask God to forgive us and ask God to, to change our life. Uh, and then when we follow God and love God, we don't have to fear Satan at all. And then His Word, God's Word, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and I shall, it shall prosper in the thing for which I send it. So God said in Isaiah 55, 11, that He will accomplish His work by the Word of God. So what does this verse tell us about the power of God's Word? The, God's, the Word of God is powerful. It's powerful to achieve God's purpose, to convert people, to change people, to help people to grow. So we believe that God's Word is powerful. So how does this help our, ministry, our attitude toward ministry? Then we have confidence when we preach the Word of God. I've seen many people, they preach the Word of God, they just talk very briefly about it and then they go on to something else and they don't explain how to apply it. It's very important to explain how to apply it. For instance, just now I talked about Satan. Satan's uh, attack, we have authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, that nothing will harm us. Then how to apply it? When we, we know that when we uh, have a close relationship with God and don't sin, then we have the power to trample on scorpions and snakes and they cannot harm us. So the Bible tells us they cannot harm us. So we don't have to fear the devil and we don't have to blame the devil for things we do when we have a you know, have a bad relationship with someone, we repent of our sins instead of blame the, blaming the devil. We say, Lord, help me to repent and help me to forgive and love that person, to build up the relationship with the person and listen to the person and, and not to regard the bad relationship as an attack from Satan. So explain this verse, apply it to uh, uh, attack from Satan, the concept of attack from Satan. So I for me, I don't like to think about the attack from Satan. I, I like to think about what have I done wrong in a relationship with God and with people. If I have not done anything wrong now, of course, we, we're not perfect. But still, you know, if it's not because of my sins that this problem comes, it's not necessarily the attack of Satan. It could be attack of people. Now, some people are influenced by Satan because they live in sin and they have a lot of anger. They want to yell at people. Now they yell at us doesn't mean that Satan is attacking us. It's him who attacks us. He's controlled by Satan and he attacks us. Satan tried to attack us through him. But if I don't take it as an attack from Satan. I just say it's a person and I just don't take it seriously. I just don't take his words, his negative words, his yelling, I don't take it personally. I just forgive and be nice to him and kind to him, then I have victory. So I have victory when I obey God and I love God. 
and then I don't have to be afraid of attack from Satan. So, so this is how to explain the verse and apply it to people, and not just, you know, uh, apply it in a way that is not biblical or just say the verse and then continue to talk about different things. Sometimes I heard some sermons of pastors, and then they just talk about how someone had been healed, how someone has been changed, how the church has grown, how what has happened to some people, and it's not preaching. It's it's in a way is boasting about the church, about what he is doing. So we should not be talking. You know, we can share about those things, but the main thing is that we want to. Uh, explain the Word of God and apply to people so people know how to apply the Word of God in their life. 1 Corinthians 3 verses, uh, chapter 3 verses 8 to 13, our work will be tested with fire. We could be building with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. So what do these verses remind us to pay attention to? What motivation can we have toward our ministry? So re remind us that the quality of our good works is very important. Whether we do it out of love of money or love of power, or whether we do it out of love for God, honor for God, and love for people. We care about the people. We want people to, to be blessed by God. We want people to be saved. We want people to be changed by God. Then we are motivated by the Word of God, by God's way, by, God's, uh, by the love from God and the love for people. And then it will be gold, silver, and precious stones. But if people have the wrong motives, even if they have a big church, now there are some churches that are big because they use maybe miracles to attract people. Now, miracles are real, but there are also miracles that are not real because there are some people who don't have a close relationship with God and they uh, instead they just seek healing. They don't bring people to God. Then. They can be used by Satan. So we want people, we want to follow people who love God and love the Word of God and obey God and pray with power and then they can have healing. This is wonderful. And um, so even when people, they tra attract people by different ways, miracles or, or by just by personal relationship. Now we want to build up good personal relationship with people. But if we just have good pers personal relationship and don't teach them the Word of God and don't teach them to obey the, the, the Word of God, then we, we still, our ministry is still wood, hay, and straw. We want to bring people to Jesus, to love Jesus, to honor Jesus, to follow Jesus. And, those, and when we have this pure motivation of blessing people with the Word of God, with the presence of God, with following God and believing in God, then it's gold, silver, and precious stones. So what motivation can we have toward our ministry? Uh, the motivation is that God will remember. If I do it with a pure motive, if I just love God and love people, God will be happy and God will bless my life and it will, be, it will stay forever in eternity. Now we're not proud of it. We just acknowledge that it's God's reward and I thank God for that and God will remember every good thing I do for people. I don't have to count all the good things I've done for people. I just keep doing it. I just want to bless people and help people and then God will be happy and all these things I do with the pure motives will stay forever and ever. So that will motivate us to serve God with a pure motive. Okay, handling failure. So when Paul was hard pressed on every side and crushed, uh, uh, yet he's not crushed. He, he couldn't understand why things happened that way, but yet not, he's not in despair. He was persecuted, but he was not forsaken. His struck down was not destroyed. So always carrying the death of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> so the life of Jesus will be maybe manifested in our body. So how can we face <coughs> difficulties and failures? <coughs> we know that God is happy with everything I do. Even when I'm persecuted, God knows it and God will reward me. God will give me strength. And so when I'm persecuted, it doesn't matter. If people attack me, it doesn't matter. Now we want to handle it, but we don't want to be overwhelmed and knocked down. But we want to 
still stay in the presence of God and trust in God to resolve the problem and we try to resolve the problem in a gentle way. We want to ask God's wisdom, how to handle it gently with wisdom, wisdom so that it doesn't hurt the ministry more. If some people want to attack us or our ministry, we want to resolve the problem with gentleness and with love so that we can uh, uh, handle the problem and then we can uh, grow in the Lord. So um, instead of uh, being knocked down and fight back and then the fighting back will cause the church to split. So we want to be able to handle failure with, uh, with peace. Okay, now, um, so we have finished this part of uh, doing ministry, uh, the essential qualities of people who serve God. So we have uh, gone through the questions and this will help us how to have the right attitudes, the essential qualities. Now I haven't seen any from the group to respond to me. Tell me whether you are seeing this uh, clearly. Okay, I will stop for a, I will stop briefly and restart it right away and to find out what's happening. Okay, I'll stop briefly. I'll find out what's happening. Okay, God bless you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'll close with the prayer now. Dear Lord Jesus, please help us to have the right attitude of ministry. We want to serve God with peace and joy and love love for God and love for people with a pure motive, not for money, not for power, not for recognition, but f just for your glory. We want people to know how wonderful you are, how, how great you are, how loving you are, how powerful you are. We want people to know you and admire you and adore you and worship you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you and worship you. In